Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Shea, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges at uh, NATO headquarters. Uh, first of all, I apologize for that incredibly long job title, but it wasn't my decision. Um, I'd like in a couple of minutes to give you a sense of where we are today in dealing with terrorism. Uh, the first thing is that in the NATO countries, there could be a sense of relief. Uh, that since 9-11 we haven't experienced uh, another uh, spectacular, uh, devastating attack on that kind of scale. It's not because the problem has gone away. Uh, indeed, we know of many efforts by various groups linked to Al-Qaeda since 9-11 to hijack aircraft or to blow up uh, important monuments in our capitals or to attack mass transportation systems. It's simply because uh, the cooperation among intelligence services, police, the armed forces, in exchanging information, uh, for example, uh, in in pursuing common arrest warrants has stopped uh, many of those attacks from happening. Uh, but we shouldn't feel any kind of complacency at all, because my main message to you today is that terrorism, instead of going away, is in fact becoming an even greater threat and closer to Europe than it was, for example, when it was emerging in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, in the shape of Osama bin Laden at the end of the uh, 1990s, across a broad swathe now uh, from the Sahel across northern Africa uh, into the Middle East. We see a proliferation uh, of uh, groups uh, which of course uh, are linked essentially to local conflicts in that region but which are also proclaiming their allegiance to Al-Qaeda uh, and therefore the international uh, globalist uh, jihad. Uh, there's a new generation of leaders uh, on whom we know very little compared with the old Al-Qaeda uh, generation that's largely now been uh, removed from the scene since 9-11 uh, and uh, there are a baffling number of different groups many of which uh, are a uh, with each other. For example, Al-Shabaab in Somalia is linking up to Al-Qaeda in the Arabic Peninsula, uh, Boko Haram, which has just kidnapped uh, those hundreds of school children in Nigeria, is linking up to another group called Ansaru. Uh, the Mujahu uh, in Mali or uh, the Sahel region is linking up with an Algerian uh, group uh, under uh, Mokhtar Belmokhtar that recently attacked, uh, some of you will recall, uh, an oil uh, and gas refinery. Uh, in the uh, uh, southern uh, Algerian provinces. Um, and therefore, what we are increasingly seeing is, is a narrative in which the uh, jihadist struggle is being shaped by the overall Al-Qaeda uh, narrative. Uh, also, uh, although we may feel comparatively safer in Europe, let's not forget that the number of people who are dying uh, from terrorism uh, is now uh, once again uh, rising. Over the last three years, according to the START Center at the University of, of, of Maryland, we have witnessed a 69% increase in global terrorist uh, incidents and uh, an 89% uh, rise in fatalities in 2012 alone to a figure of 15,500. Uh, uh, now it's true that almost 60% of those fatalities occurred in, in just three countries, Iraq, Afghanistan uh, and, and Pakistan, but we're seeing an increasing number of those casualties in an increasing number uh, of other countries as, as well. Uh, uh, in 2013, um, 5,100 terrorist incidents uh, were registered uh, in the first half of the year uh, alone, compared with 8,500 for the whole of uh, 2012. There are two particular areas which should now concern us. The first one is, of course, Syria. Uh, Western intelligence agencies calculate that 11,000 foreign fighters have gone to join the various jihadist groups in Syria. About 3,000 to 4,000 of those come from European Union countries. My own country, the United Kingdom, we calculate that about 700 Brits have gone off to fight. France, about four to uh, 500. Uh, and we saw, for example, that the French national who recently attacked the Jewish uh, uh, Museum in, in Brussels have not only been radicalized in prison, which is an increasing feature of a number
number of so-called lone wolf jihadists from European countries, but also, also spent some time in Syria as well. Syria, compared to Afghanistan and Pakistan, is very easy to uh, get to uh, as, as well. Uh, we also see now in Iraq how there is a spillover uh, from uh, ISIS in particular, the, one of the most powerful jihadist groups, uh, uh, out of Syria uh, into many of the Sunni areas of Iraq. And that means that we could once again, if we're not careful, be confronted uh, with a jihadist state, not just a number of groups, but an actual physical territory like Afghanistan, a black hole, which could be used to mount uh, attacks. So the first thing is to recognize that there is not only an increasing terrorist threat to Europe, but also that terrorism in North Africa and the Middle East risks destabilizing many of these countries, which have been in a fragile process of democratization and reform. For example, it's no coincidence that the only three countries where polio can still be found are Nigeria, Afghanistan and Pakistan, which also suffer from high levels of jihadist violence uh, and, and extremism. So what are we going to do? Number one, let's, despite all of the attention in NATO at the moment on Russia and Ukraine and back to, uh, if you like, conventional uh, deterrence, let's keep uh, focused on this threat. The South is going to remain as important as the East. Uh, and indeed, in terms of the threat, immediate threat to our populations, probably even more significant. Number two, let's learn the lessons of what we got right uh, in com confronting terrorism and what we got wrong uh, from the experience in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 12 uh, uh, years. Number three, let's m continue to step up our intelligence cooperation so that we can anticipate as much as possible where the next wave of attacks is going to come from. Number four, let's keep a high number of special forces that could be, if necessary, deployed rapidly to prevent a situation where a terrorist group could take over an entire state. The current situation with ISIS moving on uh, Baghdad in Iraq is obviously uh, a case in point. Let's also, number five, continue to exchange best practices among ourselves. What, for example, can we do to counter the very successful jihadist internet propaganda, which means that no matter how many you arrest, the uh, ability of these groups to attract new recruits never seems to dry up. How can we fight that terrorist narrative better? How can we make sure that our prisons do not become the new universities of radicalization. And then finally, one thing in the alliance that we are engaged with is capacity building. Uh, many of these countries, Iraq is a case in point, have very fragile security forces which find it difficult to cope with terrorism. How can we train them, equip them, help them, while making sure that they don't make mistakes, like committing human rights abuses, which could only play into the hands of the uh, jihadists. And as NATO withdraws from Afghanistan, but organizations like the African Union or the United Nations in the Central African Republic, in Somalia, uh, in the Sahel, in Niger and others, as these organizations stay involved, how can we help to train them? One final example I leave you with, which I've been involved with personally, is that, as you know, in Afghanistan, the biggest terrorist device against our soldiers has been the improvised explosive device. Over 50% of our casualties have been caused by these roadside bombs. The United Nations alone last year experienced 5,000 attacks against blue helmet peacekeepers outside Afghanistan. So at the moment in, in Madrid, in a NATO school, we are training UN forces on how to detect and deal with these improvised explosive devices. So terrorism is a networked approach and we're going to have to have a network solution. Uh, but one thing is for sure, uh, this problem uh, is like a hydra, it adapts uh, and doesn't go away.